football family, generations of Walters, all yeah. forged in this very proud working class footprint of Ipswich. This must be one of the best family trees in rugby league. Yeah, well, it's certainly one that I'm very proud of and honoured to be involved in as such. I mean, rugby league's been our life, of all of our lives. Um, from a young age uh, in Ipswich, when you grew up, you either played cricket in the summer and rugby league in the winter months. And uh, that continued for a long time for us all. And then we all played for Queensland under 18s, which is, I think hasn't been repeated. Uh, and then into well, myself, Kerrod and Stephen all playing for Queensland and Australia. It's, yeah, it's been a great ride, really good ride. How did things go down in, in Merton Street, East Ipswich? How, yeah. how, who ran the house? Well, well, Dad ran the house and it was actually great on Origin Nights. I still remember it as a young boy sitting down. We all used to pick our teams and write them out and hand them into the chief selector, which was Dad. <laughs> And then, you know, probably 10 minutes later, the, the team was announced on the radio and we all check, oh, I thought he'd get in, oh, he shouldn't be there, you know. And then I, it was really weird, 40 odd years later, I, I'm sitting down with Gene Miles and Darren Locker actually selecting the Queensland State of Origin team. So, and you've got to get it right, haven't you, Ronnie? You get it wrong and everyone in Queensland will let you know. They've all got an opinion. They've all, they've all got an opinion. And one particular story, 2017, Gene Miles and Darren Lockyer left Billy Slater out of the State of Origin game, team for, for round one. I wasn't even in the side, of course, but they... they no, I'm just joking. We, we elected not to have Billy. We got belted by New South Wales at Suncorp. For game two, we're sitting around the Walters table and my two youngest children, Harry and Ava, um, brought back a sign bring back Billy in pretty big words and underneath it in even bigger letters, you dickhead. <laughs> <laughs> Origin has always been a mainstay in, in your family and, yeah. and in your life. Uh, even from when your eldest brother first represented yeah. in the curtain raiser under 19's very first state of origin. This has gone down in folklore. Yeah. The Walters, it's like Try. the clampets rolling up yeah. to Lang Park. We did, it was an old uh, Holden Kingswood, the yellow one station wagon, so Kara and I were sitting in the back. The queue was way up past Forex along Milton, because there was no ticket tech in those days. You couldn't pre-book tickets or... Just cash just at the line, gate? It, line up as you, as you did. And uh, we got a park, a pretty good park, not, not far from the stadium, and we just were no chance of getting tickets. I'm not sure if Dad knew that we weren't... No chance of getting tickets, but he bought a pair of pliers with him and he cut a hole in the fence um, at the, the, the southern end, uh, the Milton Road end of... of it was Lane Park in those days, and we all just climbed through, us and about 10,000 other Queenslanders just went through this fence and was yelling and screaming. It was, it was, it was in broad daylight, like it wasn't dark. It was early because the, the under-18s game that Brett was playing was on a bit earlier, so it was just amazing. And then to, to be there when Arthur Beetson sort of ran out, it was something that always stayed with me as well. I can still see it and hear the noise of, of the Queenslanders. It was really good. What was the atmosphere and what shifted inside of you that you thought, I want to be there one day, I want to be on that turf yeah. wearing maroon, playing for my state? Just the way that Arthur that night, I mean, I was only 13 years old, but I just remember the passion that he had, you know, for Queensland. I, they all thought he was too old. I still remember the white powder he put on his jersey and just running out and he just destroyed uh, New South Wales just with that Queensland passion that no one had seen before. I just remember from that moment forward, uh, going back in the back seat of the, of the yellow Kingswood. Um, just a happy family and wanting to do that one day myself. Your parents, Kevin Senior and Sandra, five boys, busy house. Busy house. What did they teach you about hard work, staying humble and being mentally resilient? Uh, Dad was a carpenter, very hard working. Mum was a nurse, so she worked three days a week, five kids under five. Just seemed to work well, you know, as a family. We never missed out as kids on anything, sporting equipment, playing anywhere, and they'd always travel and get us there. You know, they were just great parents and very supportive. And it was, uh, I remember when Stephen actually went to the Raiders and they, they caught buses to Canberra and the first grand final in 87 at the Sydney Cricket Ground, they, they caught a bus down to that because it was too expensive to fly. And You would know this, in rugby league, there's always a better brother. Yeah, it doesn't matter if there's the superstar at <laughs> a club, there's always a better brother at home. Who was the better brother within the In walls? the backyard? In the backyard. Oh, that's me, clearly, in the backyard. <laughs> I was a standout, Bon. 
We had a red-headed brother, Andrew, who's the fiery one, and used to <laughs> niggle him a bit, and he would just lose his marbles, wanted to fight everyone. And, and then Stephen was a bit of a, bit of a scaredy cat in those days, and then Kerrod uh, as well. But Kerrod was... He didn't... Didn't do too, show too much promise in the backyard, I've got to say, Kerrod. But uh, as He's he a late on, bloomer. He was a late bloomer, yeah. But, um, yeah, we were very competitive in the backyard. Mum actually invented the, the sin bin. She used to... Um, if it got a bit heated, she'd get the hose out and hose us, making sh just to cool us down. And she'd say, right, time out here. You're not playing until you're all playing normal. And don't be fighting each other and aggressive. So we'd stop for a bit and get ready and then go again. And we all had um, players who we loved in, in Sydney at the time. But my favourite was Tommy Rodonigas, and I was all over Tommy. The true blue the, Tommy Rodonigas. Well, we're supporting the New South Wales. This is in the New South Wales Rugby League, so yeah. the Sydney Rugby League then. So, And we used to get one game a week on telly, which is always on a, on a Saturday afternoon, and we'd sit around the TV and watch it and just look at these our heroes they were on telly. So you grew up wanting to be Tommy Rodonikus. Yeah. He, he had that real aggressive streak. Do you uh, have yeah. that bit of dirt in you because you're so jovial nah. and fun and I think cheeky? If you, if you, yeah, I, I'm very competitive, but I wouldn't say I was ever as tough as, as Tommy. I remember playing against Tommy in a game in Ipswich when Tommy must have been 42 or 43 years old and I was a young halfback. This was just local club football in Brisbane and we were playing in first grade and it was a scrum packed and Tommy just looked at me and he had like spit and dribble coming out of his mouth and he just said if you win this scrum your life's not worth living <laughs> something like that I'm, I'm sure that's a very because I was the ball. Remember, the scrum just to be yeah. competitive so you had to put the ball sort of in the middle of it. it's all yours Tommy you take it mate it's all yours and we end up absolutely hammering them but I remember shaking hands with him after the game and then about a week later he came to knocking on our house and, and wanting the, us to sign and play for the Jets, which was a really special moment for me because my hero growing up actually wanted me to play in his team, which was really special. What influence did he have on you as a, as a young half and a, a young playmaker who wants to... You, you're certainly thinking about mixing it in Sydney if you get that opportunity. And there's Tommy, who's, who's now gone from your idol to your coach. Yeah. Well, I guess the thing that Tommy... Uh, two things that Tommy taught me, or well, three things, really. First thing is, like, be competitive. Uh, the second thing was uh, never give up. And the third thing was the fun side of rugby league, which often gets, you know, forgotten or neglected. Speaking of fun, it feels like the right time to bring up the unofficial sixth Walter brother, <laughs> Alan Jeffrey Langer. Yeah. When did Alfie make himself known in the Walters household? Well, his dad and my dad were part of a committee, which were the parents and old boys of schoolboy rugby league in Ipswich. So Alf would have been, I reckon, probably six when we first sort of met each other. Uh, and they, the Langers would come around and they'd, they'd have this meeting under our house for the parents and old boys and the Langer kids would come over and we'd have a game of footy in the backyard, Langers v Walters. That didn't happen a lot. But then I remember playing against Alf because... I'm a year younger than Alf. But you got two inches on him. I got two inches. <laughs> I certainly <laughs> so have. So he's a year well, older, but you got Everyone's got, got two inches on Alf. <laughs> um, but so, Kara, and I believe this as much as you like, we played up uh, a year. This would have been under six, so under seven. So Kara and I were six, Alf, we were seven. And Alf got the ball and just ran around everyone, and which he did. He was scoring six and seven tries a game. And we're sitting under the post, and Kara still thinks that he said to Alfie, one day, mate, you'll play for Australia. What's the funniest thing you've ever seen him do? One of my favourites is we, we played a game in, in Sydney. It was a Friday night and we went into the cross, the bourbon and beef. Yes, <laughs> beef uh, steak. That's where we <laughs> always used to end up. There was all these bikes, like motorbikes, lined up on the outside, probably six or seven. And Alf got on one and put the helmet on and just started, <laughs> you know, and we go, mate, what are you doing? And this bloke, big Hells Angels, come up, like, behind him and just, like, grabbed We're trying to tell him, stop, stop, get off. And he's going... Rrr. Anyway, the Hells Angel picked him up like that like and put him on the ground. He said, what do you think you're doing, mate? It's my effing bike. Who are you, anyway? And he took his helmet off. He said, is that you, Alfie? Ah, oh, come here, mate. And he cuddled him. I'll take you for a lap. What do you want to do? He's now doing hot laps he's, around he's the cross. With this Hells Angel. <laughs> Only Alfie can get away with that. I thought, I thought he was gone for all money, but he found a way. <laughs> That's a very Alfie story. That's an Alfie I story. Also, you know the origin you took over to LA? Did he enter a bodybuilding competition? Yeah, I, I wasn't in, on that tour, but yeah, he did. He, he ran third. Mr. Personality. In his undies? In his undies, yeah. <laughs> but there was all these big guys. I, I wasn't there, but he tells me there's all these, like, massive weightlifting guys, you know, and bodybuilding guys, and they're all Americans and full of bravo, and Alf 
got, got the kid off down to the undies and won them with the personality. Posey. Yeah, <laughs> Posey. <laughs> After footy, were you always clear about what you wanted to do? I mean, obviously, rugby league was still going to be part of your life in some regard. Yeah. Uh, was coaching the most logical step? Is that something you wanted to pursue? The last couple of years when I was playing, I was taking a lot more notes uh, about Wayne's coaching and when I was in Origin with the different coaches, gathering all this information from not only playing with great players but also being coached by some really special people. How would you describe your coaching style and, and are you proud of the man that you've remained through it all? I feel that the only way for me to be who I can be is just to be myself. I can't pretend to be, you know, Wayne Bennett or Craig Bellamy or Mel Meninga. The moment that I sort of that, well, let's just be me, um, that's when that's when things started happening for me. Me as a person, I'm, I'm a hard person, but I'm a fair person. Um, that's how I, I feel what works for me. I'm a, I feel like I'm a really good communicator, um, which I sort of stopped doing a little bit when things weren't going so well, which even, you know, as I've learned, when, that's probably when you need your best communication when things aren't going so well. So, we, you know, we got on top of that. Um, and the third thing, and I mentioned earlier about just the enjoyment factor, what rugby league is. You've had a lifelong association with Wayne Bennett through the, the BRL in Canberra and here, Queensland and Broncos. And how has your relationship changed with Wayne over the years? Because he's a very different character, he's a different personality type. Mm. And I can only imagine how hard it was when he made that call to get rid of you from the coaching staff from a club that you loved your whole life. Yeah, that, that took a while to, to get over, but I understand uh, it was a tough decision for Wayne to make as well. And I've had to make those decisions myself now as a coach here, uh, moving on players and staff who you're quite, uh, you've got a, quite a strong attachment to. But that's that's rugby league. What I love about you and your style is, and whether it was a, as a player or a coach, is that you are not afraid of emotion. Have you always been quite an emotional person? Always been a crier. Yeah, always been a sookie. A um, couple of good stories. Uh, Stephen used to tease me that if I couldn't throw a six at Monopoly, I'd start <laughs> crying, throw the toys out. And the other one was we're playing I must be under eights or under nines in Ipswich, and I was the captain, or and Kerrod was in the team. And then the referee made me stop being captain because I was crying so much. <laughs> for well, you were whatever, playing. Because we were losing. And, yeah. Anyway, the referees called Carrot over and said, you better tell your brother if he starts crying one more time, I'm going to have to send him off. <laughs> so Carrot came over to me and said, mate, you've got to stop crying. She's gonna, he's going to send you off. <laughs> what for? Get off. Oh, you got oh, they just got sent off for crying. So I've always been... A, Emotional person. That's why I like to see it. I heard when you applied for the coaching job here at the Broncos, you, you weren't afraid to get emotional and you spoke about what this club meant to you and yeah. what it stood for and where you could take the club. It provided me with some wonderful opportunities um, in life and I want, I want to provide those opportunities for the next generation of Broncos. And not just, just the players, but the whole community of Brisbane. When the Broncos are, are flying, everyone's life is just that little bit easier. It's a bit like when Queensland win... Origin, the next day we bounce out, we're ready to go. Sun's a bit brighter. Sun's a bit brighter, uh, which has been very bright lately, hasn't it? It has. It has. It's um, been a good thanks, time. Thanks, Billy, and your gang. <laughs> the Walters family lineage still going strong. Billy, second generation Bronco, which yeah. I think is beautiful. You've got Harry and Ava, they're at North. They're at North, still playing, yes. Uh, Jack and Jet, they were involved at West's up yeah. until well, recently. Jack, we've all, yeah, we're a rugby league tragic family. Not More tragic. premierships for the Walters family. Yes, we're. we're Bronco tragics, rugby league tragics, Queensland tragics and Australian tragics. Well, you're an yeah. absolute champion, Kev. We're so lucky to have you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bonnie. Lovely to see you again too.